So uh, welcome everyone. My name is Peter Young. I'm a member of the Committee 100 and I happen to be chair of this Asian American Career Ceilings Initiative uh, that this program is part of. Uh, the, uh, this, this initiative started three and a half years ago and this is actually the 33rd event that we've had. We've had in-person, we've had uh, panels, we've had a large uh, you know, brainstorming sessions with experts and so forth. So it's been a wonderful, we didn't intend to do this many, but there's been such a great deal of interest. And as we as we did, then we realized there are so many different angles that uh, one needs to consider. So we'll run out at some point, but uh, thus far we've, uh, as long as we have a, a great deal of interest, we're gonna continue. Uh, before I introduce today's uh, panelists, uh, I want to say that uh, we are, uh, the Committee 100 has its annual conference and gala on April 19th. Uh, we hope that many of you will attend. Uh, the conference itself, uh, we have two tracks. The one, domestic issues, such as you know Asia hate or discrimination, et cetera. And then we have a, a second track, which is uh, U.S.-China issues and people exchange and culture exchange, et cetera. So we decided to do it this way so that people could really have more options uh, and could pick and choose panels. And we actually have a third track, which is just a pure networking track. So if you want to network the entire time and not listen to any speakers, uh, you'll be able to go the networking thing. But we felt that was a way to uh, really make it very worthwhile and we have some very exciting speakers. I was mentioning to our two panelists, we have five of the for former or current ambassadors to China from the U.S., uh, including you know Ambassador Burns, but Gary Locke, uh, John Huntsman, uh, Stapleton Roy, Max Aukas. They're going to be talking about their perspectives. So that's just an example of the quality of uh, people, plus some entertainment during the uh, during the gala. So I hope that uh, those of you who are interested uh, can uh, can attend and, and you can find more information and register on the Committee of 100 website. So um, today's webcast is very interesting. You know, I'm, I'm very excited about this because I do think that although we've done this panel for other different professions, media, et cetera, I think journalism has its very, very, a very, very special place in this whole equation. It, it, is, it is not only one a profession that is representative of the problem of career ceilings, but it just has an important role uh, uh, in our society. And it's a face of a society, right? Where, where people see the journalists or read the journalists. So it becomes a face of society as well. And that's an important element uh, of what impact any career ceilings have. So uh, we have we have two uh, very prominent journalists uh, who are uh, who are our panelists today. Uh, the first one is uh, Nicole Dunga, who is an investigative reporter for the Washington Post, uh, that well-known uh, periodical. But she also is president of the Asian American uh, Journalists Association. So she has sort of two hats on for this panel. I'm very pleased because. Uh, the, 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 she can speak to some of the initiatives, but also the the, the perspectives from that organization. Uh, the other is uh, Amy Jin. She's a national correspondent for the New York Times who writes some wonderful articles, recently wrote a wonderful article about uh, discrimination against, you know, Asian American officials, et cetera. So we have two, uh, two prominent journalists, but two from two well-known uh, organizations. Uh, that have their own perspectives on this issue. Um, so let me uh, just say to the audience, what we're going to do is, um, this is going to be kind of a discussion, a fireside chat. And uh, I have a list of questions that I'm going to go through with our, you know, with our panelists. But we're going to make sure we leave time at the end for questions from the audience. And the way you can ask your questions is just go to uh, the... Uh, Q&A chat box and uh, just uh, type in your questions. And the panelists and I will, will, all three of us will be able to see your questions and we'll try to handle as many uh, as, uh, as as we can. 
So first of all, though, I'd like to start out and just ask each of our the panelists to take two or three minutes, tell tell the audience what you currently do, uh, and how uh, how you got to where you are today. And of course, Nicole, you have a special part, which is just your role, you know, running the uh, Asian American Journal Associations where you're present. So if you could add on to that. So uh, we'll start we'll alphabetically by first name. So Amy, you want to start? Sure. Um, hi, Peter. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here with you. Just uh, my journey is a little bit unusual, I have to say. I didn't um, never really thought about being a journalist growing up. I grew up in California, um, and I was really interested in Chinese politics in college, and that's what I studied, um, and happened to do some internships there around 08, 09. And while I was there, I actually met some uh, New York Times journalists who at the time were like, oh, do, would you be interested in doing an internship in the bureau? Just, they just knew that I spoke Chinese and was interested in politics. Um, it was really just random. And I didn't really have any plans. Um, so fast forward to after grad school and I went and I did this internship in Beijing and um, it was great. I just never left, to be honest. Like I just uh, was there at a time when it was really interesting. There were opportunities to do like short blog posts about China. And I just, you know, got to follow um, around a lot of the reporters and see what it was like and just slowly kind of worked my way into this niche of covering culture around the Asian region um, from Beijing and then uh, became a China correspondent. I did that for a few years, um, got to work on some really big stories. We worked on the Hong Kong protests about um, Xinjiang, uh, the crackdown on Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And um, my last few stories in China were um, from Wuhan where I was uh, there after the city was locked down and was writing about the what we then what now we now know is this pandemic but at the time was just this you know unknown virus um and you weren't, you weren't the source of the virus right um not I don't know <laughs> <laughs> that would be crazy um I was part of the group that was expelled from China um the group of U.S. reporters that was expelled from China um, and after that, I went to Taipei, where I continued to write about China. And I also started writing about Taiwan a lot more, which was um, great. It was, you know, so fascinating to get to know a new place. Um, I was there from 2020 to 2022, and I moved back to the U.S. I'm based now in Washington, D.C., but I cover um, Asian American computers, uh, communities nationally, which I think is, I think, I'm pretty sure it's the first time that the New York Times has had someone dedicated to this beat. And so I feel like it's just a, a dream job. Um, I've gotten to, just in the short time that I've been in it, I've already feel like I've learned so much. Um, and yeah, that's that's where I am now. Wonderful. Nicole, your turn. Uh, thanks for having me. And uh, I actually did have a more traditional route to journalism. Um, I wanted to be a journalist when I was in high school and I interned for this magazine called Filipinas Magazine, which was based out of South San Francisco. And so I grew up in the Bay Area in California. And I just remembered being struck every time I got into a newsroom in a, the mainstream media, basically, um, and not seeing that much diversity. I mean, growing up in the Bay Area, growing up in California, you see so many people like you all the time. I was surrounded by a huge family. Uh, I was in diverse suburbs. Uh, but when it came to going into some of these newsrooms, I noticed that there weren't that many people who looked like me. And so I found that out by interning at various newspapers. I interned at the Providence Journal while I was in college and then also at the New Orleans Times-Picayune. And finally, after I graduated, I had an internship at the Oregonian. And it was there that I got my first full-time journalism job. And also just started to think more about what my path would be in journalism. I had always wanted to be a narrative writer, but it was there that I kind of fell into investigative reporting because I was covering Portland Public Schools, which was the largest district in Oregon. And if you cover basically any public agency, there is a lot to go into. There are things that don't work. There are things that are broken. Uh, and I was just really compelled to keep doing investigative reporting because I because I saw the kind of change that could happen. And so after a couple of years there, 
I wanted to come back to the East Coast um, because so many media outlets are here. I was always a big fan of the Boston Globe, and this was before the Spotlight movie had even come out. I had already known about their team uh, because of the uh, Catholic Church reporting and how much they had contributed there. And I knew I just wanted to be in a newsroom that had an investigative team and had those resources. So luckily I was hired there, um, covered transportation for a couple of years, um, notably during the worst winter in Boston when the transportation system completely broke down and then eventually made it to the spotlight team. And after that, um, after a few years there, went to the Washington Post and joined their investigative team. And yeah. through, through it all, I mean, just to kind of uh, talk about the Asian American Journal Association, it was there for me the entire time. Um, from my first job in Portland, it was uh, my, I had a stipend from the Portland chapter of AJA, And then every time I went to a new job, there was this network that was here. And I started volunteering, um, eventually becoming president of the association because I did care a lot about newsroom diversity and wanted to make sure that I helped to contribute to um, an organization that was helping to diversify the pipeline. Yeah. We'll talk more about the AJA uh, uh, later, but that is really, uh, you know, wonderful. And, uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for the kind of work that both of you do because people think it's like short, but there's a lot of research and so forth that goes into each story. And so sometimes for long periods of time. So uh, I, I respect that uh, uh, greatly. Um, so I'd like to start out with a big picture before we go into more. And that is... Um, you know, first of all, actually, journalism, there are lots of different segments of journalism, right? It's not like that's one just newspapers or magazines or broadcasts, whatever. There are a lot of segments of, of, of journalism. But let's start with the big picture. And how, in your view, either you, from work you've done or just your impression, how bad do you think the Asian American career ceiling problem is in journalism? And do you think it varies according to what part of journalism you might be, you know, situated in? I, I would say just across the board, I think if you look at every segment of journalism in American media, obviously um, Amy was in China and saw different media companies that were much more diverse being in Asia. But when you come to the US, there is just a diversity problem all over. And that's why organizations like AEJA have existed for more than 40 years. That's why other organizations for um, other minority groups like the National Association of Black Journalists, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists have existed for so long. Um, I mean, I do, I'm glad that I have a position to kind of look at different segments of the industry through AJA, um, just within my own industry, kind of in a legacy media outlet. I think you'll see that the numbers are small. They're obviously better at some of these bigger um, outlets, but they aren't nearly where they need to be. I mean, if you look at um, some of the, there's a survey that in 2019, you know, a little over 20% of newsroom workers were people of color. And obviously Asian people were a smaller swath of that. Um, and if you go to uh, individual newsrooms, it really varies in how many Asian Americans are in the newsroom and then also how many Asian Americans are in leadership. And that's something that we're really trying to work on, getting more Asian American Pacific Islanders into leadership because that's where so many of the decision-making happens. Um, but we also, at AJ, we've also tried to look at broadcast as well. And we actually had a snapshot basically looking at, you know, do the on-air anchors and the on-air talent represent uh, the kind of populations that they're covering? And we were looking at 20 local TV markets um, across the country and they found that, you know, at nearly 25% of them, there were no AAPIs on air. Uh, and then more than- At 70 all, at all, I guess. Yeah, all. they were an on air talent. Um, and then more than 70% of the stations didn't have the kind of representation that was proportionate to their population. Um, and when you think about how people get into industries, how people see themselves in the media, you know, the people you see on screen are very important. Um, and that's why we're, we're grateful we have so many great Asian American Pacific Islander broadcasters who have kind of blazed the trail, but we know that more needs to be done. 
And if you just see it in all the other um, aspects, I mean, we are lucky that we do have more Asian Americans in charge of newsrooms. I'm thinking of, you know, Sewell Chan at uh, the Texas Tribune, Jita Chua um, at Semaphore, and Julia B. Chan at uh, the 19th, and Swathi um, Sharma at um, Fox. But those are things that have come recently and, you know, are also positions that you really have to keep your eye on so that you can maintain that kind of diversity at the top of the masthead. Yeah. Do, do either of you, do you think that, you know, and this by profession, the answer to this question can be very different. Do you think that the career ceiling problem in journalism for Asian Americans, do you think it's um, aggressive or passive? You know, they're, 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 I'll explain. Passive is like, we just never thought of it was an issue. We never thought there was a problem, right? We didn't think of you, right? As uh, as as someone who wanted, and then aggressive is like, okay, we're favoring people who are white or whatever it is, so forth. Do you think that it's one or the other or some blend, you know, in, in journalism? I mean, I think it's important to understand some of the structural, more passive um, reasons why it's difficult, there might be more barriers to entry. Part of that is, of course, financial. You know, I, when you start out in journalism, certainly when I started out, you're not getting paid that much. And certainly and for many people, it's not enough to pay off loans to make to buy, you know, make rent on an apartment or on a car. And so it, there's that's that's the socioeconomic thing that also is filtered um, by race. And then I think specifically for Asian American and Pacific Islanders, the um, issue of culture. And and a lot of us are children of immigrants. Um, we didn't, I certainly didn't grow up in a household where the New York Times was being read or where there's familiarity with newspapers. I, I can't believe every time I, I meet many people in the industry, and this is amazing, I love this, but the, their parents are journalists or their grandparents were journalists. And I'm like, that is so crazy. In my mind, I'm always like, that's so crazy. My, my grandparents were farmers. Um, and so it's just very, it's just, there's not really that. Those are, there also are these sort of passive cultural factors that I think go into why Asian Americans might not go into the industry and why it's really important where I know the New York Times, for example, is, you know, um, goes to like the AAJA conference every year and recruits there. Um, why is it important to sort of make these more intentional efforts to reach people where they are and to let them know that, no, there is a place for you here in this industry. Yeah, actually, you, you make a very good point, though, about, you know, family biases, et cetera. And I think we also have to be fair and realize that some of the some of the career challenges are self induced. Right. Like my parents, you know, they just they said, well, we either want you to be a scientist or a doctor and that's it. And when I told them I wanted to go in business, they thought I had, you know, like I thought they were going to disown me. Right. So that one you can't blame on society. You know, that was a sure. bias. But, you know, it's only part of the equation, you know, obviously, right? Um, so so I guess both of you are saying, you know, it's it's across all forms of journalism. Some of it's passive, some, you know, some of it is 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 aggressive and so forth. Um, how about each of you personally? And I think you 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 may or may not feel that you were subject to uh you know career ceiling problem yourself but any comments about either your own personal experiences or the experiences you observed uh when uh, around you right people around you who were asian americans and where you saw that they ran into a problem yeah i i think i'm really lucky uh where i am but i think there's also lessons to be learned from how it, it was able to work. And I think AJ is one of those ways where I was able to find a network everywhere I could so that in the newsroom, there was someone who was kind of pushing for me, someone who could um, help me. And I think that when we think about uh, pipelines and uh, how people network and how people hire, a lot of it is, you know, word of mouth or people that they've met through various channels. And when you have leaders who do not necessarily look like you, that becomes harder. Uh, and that's something that, you know, I always talk about when people want to know what can we be doing more of. It's like, where are you recruiting from? If you're only recruiting from Ivies, who are you getting uh, when you think about the 
the populations that go there? Are you going to, you know, the schools that have lots of Asian Americans? Are you going to HBCUs? Um, and so I, um, when I was actually at the Boston Globe, I was lucky enough to be on the team of the spotlight team when there was an Asian American woman uh, as the editor. And I think that that does help, you know, obviously, you know, we do have the skills to do so, but I think when you're thinking about who you're going to hire and you can see people who look like you and know what they can accomplish, I think there are some of those biases that you're not going to have anymore about who you think is an investigative reporter. And I, I think that's, you know, obviously something, you know, Amy has been a foreign correspondent. I have been in, I'm an investigative reporter. These are very largely white male um, pipelines, if you look at some of these places. And I'm really lucky to be able to know a lot of women and a lot of people of color who have broken through um, into this, uh, you know, a pretty great field, but also a field that it, that is very selective. And so I think when I think about it, having mentors who looked like me, who knew what I went through was something that did work. Um, but then also I think other Asian Americans uh, that I've talked to through AJA, they sometimes felt like they've been either pigeonholed or they've been blocked from stories about AAPIs, like both sides of the coin. Um, when there was the Atlanta shooting, you know, of the um, six women with of Asian descent were killed in Atlanta. Um, AAJA was, you know, putting out advisories so that we could basically say these are the appropriate ways to talk about this. Um, call them spas, you know, call them massage parlors because of the history of, um, you know, basically the sexual uh, exotic uh, stereotypes that Asian women have. Um, so we had those happening. And then we also were hearing from reporters who were saying, you know, I feel like I, the only reason I'm on this story is because I'm Asian, or they don't think that I should be working on this because I'm too close to it. So I think um, as an Asian, you're kind of battling both sides of those kinds of biases, and you have to be able to say to your newsroom leaders, you know, I should be able to, I'm going to bring some sort of expertise as an Asian American, but I also, that's not the only thing I want to be doing. Um, and, you know, from the past, we've actually heard from people who said, like, they tried to downplay how Asian they really were because they felt like then you were only going to be doing the AAPI stories or they were going to a market where there was already an AAPI anchor or there was already an AAPI leader on that team where they thought they could be the only one. And those are things that um, people have struggled with throughout their time in journalism. So it's it's very, very complicated, basically. Right? Yes. Yeah. You can't just make one global statement and and say 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 it applies. Amy, any observations about people around you or yourself? You know, on this issue of career ceilings. I mean, um, I feel like I was a foreign correspondent, which is a very white male thing. But I also uh, really leaned into my strengths, as I mentioned. You know, I sort of fell into this profession, and I did. You know, because I could speak Chinese, I. I was able to do that. And I feel like I really self pigeonholed myself over the years. And I remember talking to a mentor at one point and he was saying that he had done the whole China B, he himself was ethnically Taiwanese, Chinese. Chinese. And um, he said that after that, he decided to go to Russia because he didn't want, he wanted to show that he could do something different. And obviously I've taken a very different path. I've, instead of <laughs> showing I could do something different, I've just gone harder into the, you know, sometimes I'm like, play to your strengths. Um, I, I feel like I can bring a perspective um, that is helpful on this beat, but I, it is in the back of my mind, you know, if I am to move on from this beat at some point, it's definitely a concern. Like, have I sort of backed myself into a corner where I can only do Asian related stories? I'd like to think, and I, I've been really, I feel like I've also been very lucky um, along, all along the way I've had incredible mentors, um, you know, who have been Asian and who understand what it's like to have to try to navigate these sort of networks of, and structures um, as, as an Asian person. And so um, that's why I, I just think that the leadership, having Asians in leadership is just, in Asian leadership is so important. Um, and, and uh yeah, I, I feel very lucky to be able to have started my career abroad in China where, you know, having a Chinese face was actually very helpful, not only 
um, being able to speak the language, but being able to blend into the environment. And, you know, when you're going into a village in China, you don't automatically have people calling the police on you because you kind of blend in a little bit, which is nice. Yeah, I actually, you know, you're, you're, oh, do you mind if I just kind of go off that point? Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll follow because I have a follow-on question for you, Amy, but yeah. go ahead. Oh, no, I just thought it was really interesting um, because I just recently spoke to a young reporter and she talked about the difference of going to a Trump rally where essentially, you know, she was called racial names um, and how she dealt with that. And then she was also reporting in Chinatown as a young Asian woman and how she noticed that she was getting access in ways that other people who were there, you know, reporting on Lunar New Year who were not Asian were getting access. And I think we're kind of lucky to be at this time where um, I feel like it is easier to lean into um, being Asian, being proud of that within the newsroom, I think we do owe a lot to kind of other like social social justice and civil rights movements. I mean, when we are talking about race, it's impossible to say that, you know, the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor protests don't, I mean, they obviously factored into this where people felt like we can bring our ethnicities into the newsroom and see it more as a strength. And I've seen that here, here all the time. I've done it myself. I mean, recently we did a story about the Smithsonian collecting human brains in the early 20th century. And we created a graphic novel investigation basically based on a Filipino woman. And there were at least 14 Filipinos in the newsroom or contractors who were working on it. And that's when diversity and having that kind of diversity in your newsroom really works. You know, I have a, a, a follow-on question or a comment for Amy because you talked about the fact that you were stationed in Asia, you know, uh, uh, you know, for part of your career, and that raises an interesting uh, point, which is, you know, for all these webcasts that we've had, uh, for a number of them, the person, whether it was in business or otherwise, started their career and got pulled into the quote Asia career path, right? Became, you know, China this or whatever it is, so forth. And, you know, their comment was very interesting. And so I'm going to direct this question to Amy, which is, they said there's a plus and a, and a giant minus. The plus is you have a special expertise that someone may not have because they're not Chinese or whatever. But then you can get trapped and can't get back, right? You can't get out of the Asia beat or you can't get out of the, you know, the, 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 the you know, Asia part division or whatever it is. So, you know, did you feel that, you know, uh, Amy, from when you did? And do you think that's a factor? Because this is beyond just the two of you, right? I mean, this is this, you know, whether it's the you know China beat or whatever it is, Asia beat, you know, um, it can be more than just geographic, right? I did feel that, but I don't I have to say that I don't know if it was necessarily because of my ethnicity that I felt that way as much as it is because um, being abroad, I mean, being in the U.S. reminds me how U.S. centric the U.S. <laughs> and of course, you know, foreign and international reporting is very important, but it's also very, very far. So, you know, I know people who have had who who are not ethnically Asian, um, who had careers in Asia and had a hard time getting back to headquarters or to the U.S. Um, and uh, so I can't say that it's specifically um, ethnically related, but I can see how that that would be an issue for sure. You know, I have another question for both of you. It's not on the list that I sent you. So this is a surprise question, but it's really prompted by Nicole, what you said, where one of the ways that you feel that you advanced your career was uh, networking and, and mentoring and so forth. And this has come up pretty much in every broadcast that we've had, right? Where people say, mentoring is really, really important. But they also say, you know, it's kind of a challenge because if there aren't that many Asians above you, you know, you can't mentor, be mentored by someone who is Asian because they're not there, so forth. So there've been a lot of very interesting, thoughtful insights about how you develop, uh, uh, think of mentoring in a different way than most people think of it, but also that there's mentoring that's sideways, you know, that's colleagues, it's not just people above you. So maybe the two of you, since obviously both of you, I suspect, and Nicole, you've explicitly said 
that networking and mentoring is helpful. Maybe tell the audience a little bit about how you think it works and how it how you can do, use it to to be successful, right, in your career in journalism. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes, especially when you're talking to younger people, networking sounds like some sort of strange word when really it just means making friends with similar interests in your industry. And that's really helpful. Um, and I always tell people to kind of reach out to people above you for mentorship, but also to be, you know, really open to people on your level, because especially with an industry like journalism, I mean, we are moving all over the world. Amy is literally moving continents. I'm moving, I was cross, I went cross country a couple of times. Um, and so there is that importance of getting to know people because when it does come to hiring, people do take notice of people that they've already noticed, they've already met at conventions or conferences or other reporting trips. Um, and it's just, a really easy way to get to know people and to actually learn more. I mean, I learned a lot from people that I've worked with and become a better reporter and re better writer because of people that I've worked with. And luckily there are organizations like AJ and sometimes we have, you know, explicit mentorship programs, basically. Um, like we have a mentor match program and then we have programs for college students, high school students and mid-career level people where, you know, you're able to find a new cohort and you're able to bond with those people. Um, but I think it's also important to also realize that there are going to be other non-AAPI mentors who are really pulling for you and people who really get it. And I know when I say that, like the kind of person that would be watching something like this knows exactly what I mean. It's someone who does care about diversity, someone who does want to see people go far and make sure that their newsroom or their company represents the populations that they're trying to reach. Yeah. Amy, any comments on the networking and mentoring? Um, I would just say, you know, there, if you want to be a journalist, you just have to be comfortable with reaching out to people cold. So just get comfortable with it and reach out to people. And I think also, you know, be open to the people who reach out to you too. I know often I, everyone has busy schedules and, you know, making the time to chat with people, I think is, Reward. It's not just a one-way convers. It's one-way conversation. It's it's really an exchange of information and advice. And I think everyone has something to learn from everyone. And I really would put in a huge plug for AJ. I uh, honestly, I had always knew that it existed, but because I began my career abroad, and I know AJ has some presence in Asia, but I never was able to attend. Um, and I was able to go to my first national conference um, last summer. It happened to be in DC, and it was honestly incredible to see so many Asian American journalists in the same room and, and work you know all the kind of different work that's going on and um, there's so many opportunities to have different kinds of conversations it was it was my first yeah week back from maternity leave and I was like this is my mind was blown in many different ways and um, it was and all mostly good so it was just really, really nice. I would highly recommend that people um, look at AJ and Nicole's been doing great work on that. Well, it's clearly due to superior leadership, right? <laughs> I didn't even pay her to say that. She just said it up. I know, it's true. <laughs> By the way, you know, just a, one small story on this issue of networking and mentoring um, that you should, uh, you know, I've learned a lot listening to all these panelists over the, over the last couple of years. And uh, there was one story that I think particularly highlights um, how you should not think of networking and mentoring in a conventional way. Uh, Krishnan uh, Raja uh, 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 Gopani Palan, who is the CEO of Hydra Constructibles, the famous um, executive search firm, right? He told a story how, he, and he was, we did a fireside chat, and he said, you know, he was at a consulting firm and Heydrich really wanted him to join Heydrich and switch careers. You know, so he said, wow, you know, executive search from consulting. But what he did is he went, he said, well, why don't you don't mind? I'd like to go and visit and talk to people in the various offices. So he did that. He went and he talked to various people. Unbeknownst to him, that his objective was to find out, what, you know, what is it like to be in executive search and what's a career like? But it turns out, he says later on, Part of the reason why he rose to leadership was all those friendships and so forth that he developed. So 
that's a bit you know unusual thing to do but i think his point was don't think of conventional ways to network and to mentor because there are unconventional ways that in fact you know can be very 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 successful right so so that's that um now i want to switch to the the company level right because one of the big issues these days you know around issues like DEI, corporate DEI groups and everything else and what companies are doing. What do you think companies should be doing or are doing, right, to reduce the level of Asian American career ceiling discrimination? And, you know, I know there are lots of different companies, different variety, but just basically from what you observe, what do you think that people are doing and what seems to be working, but what seems to maybe not be working at all, even if they have good intentions? I mean, there's so many things. I think, um, well, just, you know, organizations like AJ, they do have these conferences that they are able to go to, which Amy has also alluded to. And those are helpful because you do create those kinds of relationships. And, you know, the newspaper, the digital outlets and newspapers that we work for usually have recruiters um, who are specifically looking for diverse candidates. And that's great. Um, I think, a pretty obvious uh, issue now is that, you know, we're going through a time of layoffs. And when that happens, many people are leaving the newsroom. And a lot of times those might be diverse people, especially if you have layoffs hitting, you know, the recently hired people. Uh, and that's just something that, you know, AJ and other organizations are really trying to keep our eye on because, you know, when that happens, you see organizations do lose the kinds of positions that are directly for Asian American, Asian American communities. I know Amy is, covers Asian American communities, but the LA Times also had that, um, but they went through a big round of layoffs and that's one of the positions that um, was cut. And so those are things that people also have to grapple with. You know, those are the unintended things that might happen when you're going through these big fiscal crunches. Um, newsroom leaders do need to think about how do we how do we retain the diverse people that we hired? Um, and how do we make sure that the people who are here afterward want to stay um, and feel like they will be nurtured at an organization? Oh, yeah. Amy, anything you can comment or even what is being being done at the New York Times, you know, along this along this dimension? Um, yeah, I mean, I was just looking at the Times, you know, every year, for the last year, we put out a diversity and inclusion report, which um, I think is really valuable. And I'm sure a lot of news organizations also do this, but if not, they, it, it's something that I think is moving in the right direction, which is the report kind of looks at leadership levels. We've talked about this already in this conversation. It's just, it makes such a difference to have not just Asian, Asian Americans in a diverse news, you know, uh, newsroom, but at, in the leadership levels with people who are kind of thinking and shaping coverage at a sort of, at, from the top down, I think that makes a huge difference. I'm so, like my current editor is Asian American. His editor is Asian American. When I was in um, China, my direct editor was Asian. It makes a huge difference. I'm not saying that everyone, every editor by any means needs to be Asian and there's everyone brings valuable perspectives, but especially in my beat now where I'm covering Asian American communities, I don't really feel like I have to explain very often why this is an important story. Of course, we do end up having to explain it to the reader, but when we're just having these coverage conversations, it makes a really big difference. Um, and to that point, also prioritizing coverage of Asian Americans is, I was thinking about that and Nicole mentioned what happened with the LA Times, which is just, it, it it's not just charitable journalism. It's not like a box to check off, like we need to be covering more diverse communities. This is the way that you, if you wanna understand America, this America is changing very quickly. The people who are living here are changing quickly. You know, this is having people who have this nuanced understanding of these communities like this is what you need in order to really understand what's how this country is changing and um i just hope that they can bring that position back um soon and um and then just con conducting going back to the new york times report they um released data on you know 
I think just conducting more studies, like looking very closely at your newsroom, looking at pay, looking at um, uh, how many people are, and then releasing that in a very transparent way is um, really helpful as well. Yeah. You know, sadly, though, right now, there's a lot of turmoil around DEI efforts at companies, you know, because, uh, you know, after the affirmative action uh, uh, ruling by the Supreme Court, and there was, it was not just Supreme Court, but there were, you know, people who were suing companies or colleges, and universities saying you're discriminating and so forth. But it's now spilled over to DEI efforts, uh, you know, at, at companies and same people suing, you know, suing law firms that were saying you're just because of your DEI groups, you're discriminating against it. It's creating a lot of turmoil, right? It's and some companies are cutting back on their DEI uh, efforts or having to redefine you know, what it is. So it's it's going to be a challenge because there's a big need and and it's not the, the purpose is not to favor one group or that. It's just to try to create an even playing field, you know, an even playing field for everyone, right? And where someone didn't have an even playing field to help them at least get to an even playing field. But there are a lot of social things happening right now that are going to make it uh, really a challenge, right? And uh, the next couple of years is going to be tough. Um, now, one of the things I know, Nicole, you, you've got the AJA for journalism, but I also want to remind people, there are all these um, nonprofit so forth that are, and for profit, that you can reach out to that can really help you. You know, uh, Anna Mock is uh, a Committee 100 member, and she's a partner at Deloitte, but she's president of Ascend, which is a huge organization that helps uh, provide training, management training, and so forth. So, and they're, you know, they're they're industry agnostic, right? You know, they don't care whether you're a journalist or a business person and so forth. So I encourage those in the audience to look at the resources. If you're a journalist, you should, you should take advantage of AJA. But in general, you should look at these resources because there are a lot of organizations, nonprofit organizations, that their job is to try to help people succeed, right? And, you know, Sanders One, Leap, you know, they're, there are a whole bunch that you can look at. By the way, we have a social media site in Discord of Asian American, and on in it is just literally a list of every nonprofit that we can think of that somehow touches on the Asian American career ceiling. So that's a resource that uh, you could look to to see what organizations might be able to provide some help in your in in your area. So I mean, any comments about this? you know, sort of action against DEI, you know, where do you think it's heading and what do you, what do you think is the impact it's going to have on Asian Americans in the U.S.? Uh, I mean, we've written, I've seen stories, um, you know, colleges are looking at things differently, even law firms are looking at different, or those things differently. I mean, at least from my perspective at the Post, I am grateful that we do care about diversity. We just got a new publisher, and he said that's going to be one of his um, one of his areas of interest, and that always makes me feel better when I know that I'm at a workplace that cares about this. And so, I think that remains to be seen. You know, we have seen um, there was a lawsuit recently um, against Gannett from someone who said that you know, he was discriminated against by not getting a job. Um, so those kinds of threats are out there. But from what I've seen from newsrooms, there is a commitment to diversity, at least um, when they're talking to us. And I haven't really seen them pull back as much. Mm -hmm. Amy, your, your observation, do you think it's going the wrong way or, you know, or, or not? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that even people who were pro affirmative action would say that it wasn't a perfect vehicle for uh, necessarily for achieving diversity. So I think the extent to which all of these debates are kind of being had, it's like good to talk about it. Um, I don't, I, you know, there's different ways to implement, there's different, de different definitions of diversity, equity, inclusion. And um, I'm, this is a very sort of I know, but I really believe that, like, to the extent that we can have a discussion about it, you know, um, hopefully that will get us to a place where we can sort of 
better understand what we are all want in terms of like DEI and then how best to implement that in a way that's fair. That's right. So uh, we we have some questions, although we have five questions, although a couple of them are just statements as opposed to, you know, as opposed to questions. So um, I, I'm not sure what to do with them. But I have one last question for our panelists before we address some of the questions. And that is, so we have we have quite a few people online listening to this. And obviously, probably many of them are pursuing or thinking of pursuing careers in journalism. So what personal advice would you give? Maybe, you know, what takeaways would you, what personal advice would you give if this elevator speech, right? So, you know, someone, a young journalist is, gets in the elevator and says, I'm on the fourth, fifth floor, but could you give me your three or four ideas on what I should do to make sure that I, I, I succeed and don't, don't, don't suffer any obstacles? So what would that advice be? Oh, I have so many ideas. I mean, just some, some practical ones or learn another just language. Whatever you want, you want. <laughs> learn another language, just read a lot, consume media and figure out what you, what kind of media you feel like you are really uh, attuned to. I mean, I was very lucky to be able to do a podcast and kind of saw the power of audio. And that was something that I didn't really think about before. Um, and I think it's also just important for people who, if, especially if they're starting out now, to, I, I just talked to a journalism class yesterday, actually. And I mean, a really concrete thing is always go for the internship or the job that will just give you more experience in writing and producing the kind of journalism you want to produce. I think that sometimes you might get caught up in thinking about what the best name is, um, but the best training that I have are at the places where I was able to write a lot. And maybe it's covering some small town in Oregon um, or somewhere else. And that's probably where you'll get the most experience um, writing and figuring out how to be a reporter and how to talk to people and how to work with sources. And I know that, you know, the media industry is constricting a little bit, but always look for the things that give you more opportunities to actually produce the journalism you want to produce. Amy, any advice you give to the audience? Um, yeah, I mean, I say lean into your strengths. We've talked about this today already. Um, if you speak another language, see if there's a way that you can, you know, use that because I think that's, something, you know, especially if it's an Asian language, it's something that a lot of newsrooms lack right now. Um, acquire new skills. Uh, I do teach a journalism class now and I'm so impressed by when I talk to my students, they all have multimedia projects. They don't never just want to do text. They're like audio and data visualization. But the more that you, that's, I think that's smart. That's the way that you can kind of keep up with the way that the uh, newsrooms are evolving. Um, and just find people that uh, are willing to mentor you and, that, and, and try to just soak it all in. Like, don't, I love remote work, but I think it is really, really valuable to be in the newsroom and to overhear conversations and to go on trips, reporting trips, or to tag along with other reporters who are more veteran and who you can watch how they work and kind of figure out what worked for you too. Um, I learned so much from doing that. So I think that's all super valuable. Uh, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, so Gil uh, Asakawa says, uh, here's my question. AJ, AJ spoke up and criticized the Nebraska governor for his uh, racialized comments. What's the process that AJ uses to have such situations brought to your attention, I guess, to also decide how you want to respond? I guess this is a question for Nicole, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so if you didn't hear about that, um, I'm actually meeting that re reporter soon. She's really talented and she was uh, working on a story about uh, businesses related to the Nebraska governor and she for the free water press. And she was uh, somebody asked the governor about her work and he essentially called her a communist and dismissed her reporting. Uh, and AJ thought it was just a very obvious thing to stand up for that reporter and to, because her newsroom was uh, standing behind her reporting. 
Um, and for AJ, I mean, we have uh, we have a committee called Media Watch, and this is something that we look into all the time, basically trying to um, put out proactive advisories when we see things about Asian American communities and news in which we think that, you know, people might get it wrong. We want people to have pronouncers and explainers and also, you know, how to avoid talking about things in a way that might be offensive. Uh, but we also react to those kinds of um, statements. Uh, that's one recent example. And so that just goes through a committee. I mean, people uh, call us all the time, text us all the time and say, this thing happened, is AAJ going to speak up about it? Um, and, you know, we are a journalism organization, but when we are talking about our members um, and free press and press freedom, we always endeavor to really talk about it and make sure that um, our members know we're standing behind them and really care about making sure that, um, you know, there's no space for that kind of language in journalism. Yeah, you have to say something or 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 it doesn't, you know, it keeps on going. There's a question here from Henry Tang, which could be addressed by either one of you. Henry Tang actually is a Committee 100 uh, member and is one of the founders of Committee 100 35 years ago. Uh, he's, his question is, Western coverage of Asian news uh, events and how can the Asian editorial, American Asian editorial participation be broadened? I guess he's implying that it's not broad enough. Any any comment? So maybe it's the first part of the question was, sorry to interrupt. Has the oh, loss of Asian well. journalistic editors colored or biased Western coverage? Of, oh, it's right? a two part. Oh, it's a two part. It's together? <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't figure out what the first one was. So you're right. You, <laughs> you skip the one in the middle, you you combine them. That's right. Okay. So has a lack of Asian journalist editors colored or biased Western coverage of Asian news events? And how can Asian American editorial parts? That makes much a lot more sense. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> I mean, we, uh, yeah, go ahead, Amy. Yeah, go ahead, Nicole. No, no, you, you Oh, no, I think that, um, I mean, AJ does try to respond to this. And also if you, anyone in a newsroom, I think does this in a in an informal way. You know, if you see in the Slack that the coverage, you know, somebody isn't using the right term or they don't necessarily know the context of some something um, or something might be racially, charged in some way, you know, you always see journalists of color um, giving their input and hoping that the the coverage that we put out is as accurate as possible, um, according to our communities. And I think AJ sometimes steps in, in a formal way when we're putting out advisories about, you know, this is the proper way to say this, or if you need help pronouncing these names, this is how um, you say that. That's one example of what we did with the Atlanta shooting. We put out a pronouncer. I mean, when we put out the advisory and the pronouncers, our site crashed because so many people were going to see it. Like, that's how necessary that kind of information is um, for newsrooms who may not know the proper way to pronounce things, uh, Asian names, or how to properly talk about news events. That's right. Amy, do you have any co comments on that question? is a good question, but it's hard for me to speak to because <clears throat> I don't really have a lot of insight into that level of um, decision making on editorial stuff. Okay, there's a question here. There's one just informational question. Uh, Betty Ming Leo said, can we get the link to the Committee 100 list of resources on Discord? Thank you. The answer is I will email everyone who registered for this and give you the link to the Discord site. Now, with that, there's a question from Jen Chen. Uh, what is something any Asian American can do every day to encourage and foster increased coverage of AAPI in the media here, such as promoting more outlets to dedicate resources to cover Asian Americans, just like the New York Times did? Subscribe to us. <laughs> That's a really big one. <laughs> I mean, um... I know it's hard uh, for some people to pay for their news, especially younger generations, but you know, we are we are creating the news and this is how 
really high quality journalism is made is because we have subscribers, um, you know, the things that we, that Amy and I do, they take a lot of resources and we're only able to do them because we are properly funded. And so, you know, supporting your local outlets that you really appreciate, I think, and local and national international outlets that you really appreciate, I think are really important. And, um, you know, even just sending around some of that work, if you feel like it really resonates with you, I think is one thing and promoting that and also telling those people who produce that journalism that it meant something to you because, you know, those kinds of things, when things get lots of um, engagement, it tells a newsroom, those are the things that we should be covering. Yeah. Amy, any, any comments from you, Amy? I'm very self-serving. I mean, I just published a call out basically <laughs> to readers saying what Asian American stories would you like to read? So uh, if anyone wants to fill that out, then <laughs> um, but otherwise I, I, yeah, I would just echo um, what Nicole said, you know, subscribe if you can or share or share articles. Yeah, I'm happy to say I'm a subscriber, both of the Washington yeah, Post and New York Times. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, yeah, right. Uh, do your part. But actually that raises one issue, you know, because the journalists, journalism and journalism is going through some serious challenges and structural changes. And some people are doing things that have made some radical changes that have been successful. You know, New York Times has pivoted heavily to digital, right? As in the Washington Post, others are just getting crushed, right? You know, as some of the some of the famous periodicals, so forth. But with all the things that are being done, right? And then I guess I'm not supposed to use the word AI in in this webcast either, right? Um, how what effect is it having on journalists, but also specifically this topic, which is, you know, if you were going to give advice to some of the people here, well, how would that change how you feel they should pursue a journalistic career given the structural changes that are happening? Uh, in regards to AI specifically, or no, or no, no, AI is just larger. one. Of, AI is is one of the things that's happening that's on the ne negative, maybe negative side. But other things have been positive, right? I mean, the New York Times, for example, and the Washington both both pivoted heavily to digital, and it's been successful or it's helped, right? Yeah, I mean, I think you know the financial pre pressures notwithstanding, you know, the idea that we can reach as many people, reach many, many, many more people now, I think is something that's really encouraging. Uh, I think we're all trying to get more audiences and broaden audiences worldwide in a way that we weren't really able to do, you know, in decades past. Um, but if you're trying to get into this industry, I mean, I think just trying to figure out what kind of journalism most appeals to you and what you think people will consume is really important, whether that means, you know, are you really, I don't know, maybe there's going to be this huge VR push you know, or maybe you love video, maybe you love audio, maybe you love social media, or you're like the biggest TikTok influencer in your school. Um, there are ways to make that work in journalism. And I think if you just try to uh, create the kind of content that you think that people care about, uh, that will serve you well. Yeah, and there's some positive areas too, like podcasts didn't exist, right? 10 years ago and now they're hugely positive so it's not all it's not all negative right i mean you have but you have to step back and look at what's happening and plan your career to take into account where things are headed right and and uh you know uh or 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 you'll be run over right i, I think right but there are also opportunities within even industries that are you know that are under a lot of pressure so we have reached the end of our hour. We we pride ourselves on starting on time and ending on time, not to discourage panelists or, or attendees. I really want to thank uh, the two of you, Amy and Nicole, for really uh, the insights that you provide. It's very, very valuable, and but also that the work that you do, which obviously uh, has been very, very impactful. And so I want to also thank the audience for some uh, some good questions. 
And again, uh, we're going to be, we have the, the rear ceilings events every month to six weeks or so. So there'll be another one probably in March. But also, I also encourage those of you who are interested to attend our April 19th conference. But also, I just want to mention that the Committee 100 uh, uh, Asian American Career Ceilings uh, team is putting together a summit in June where we're going to gather senior people in the nonprofits related to career ceilings, but also DEI, and get together to compare notes, to talk about what each is doing, to try to encourage collaboration, but to brainstorm and come up with new solutions and ideas and hopefully get them launched. Uh, so we'll let people know, but we just want to let you know, those of you who are involved with DEI groups or Asian Merit, you know, nonprofits related to career ceilings, that we're going to be holding this event in, in June in New York, in person with some hybrid, right? Uh, so thank you very much. And this is being recorded and will be posted on the Committee 100 website. So Nicole and Amy, you can binge watch and or 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 send a link to your parents and say, look, I have a legitimate career here. <laughs> yeah. So uh, right. So uh, but uh, also for those of you who want to watch it again or those of you who are friends who haven't, it's going to be available. So thank you very much uh, again. And I thank the audience for uh, for participating. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.